Uh, thanks again to all the organizers and filmers and you know, uh, Adam and Arrestus and Andy. Uh, I want to thank Carrie and Julian for their excellent talks. I want to thank Carrie for graciously enduring my combativeness. For Julian for uh, um, graciously enduring my completely wrong-headed question at lunch. I had read the topic of his paper, just the title but not the abstract, and it referred to grip. I've been thinking lately about like bodily action and whether bodily actions could be representations. So I'm not thinking about like this kind of grip, and I'm asking about this kind of grip, and it's graciously humoring me. <laughs> so thanks, Julian. Um, uh, I want to sort of thank you all in advance for um, staying for this second talk and for um, humoring me as I go through something that is very recently written. Um, so you got a lot of earlier, in the earlier talk, you got a presentation of lots of ideas that I've been thinking about for, for years in some cases. Um, this, uh, in contrast, is, is quite new. And I hope you can help me out with some of the gaps that remain. All right, so I'm going to talk about personal identity, basically the old, good old fashioned notion of personal identity. Uh, and I'm going to start with some talk about Locke, John Locke, famous English philosopher, really got the Western philosophical world uh, going on this question in contemporary times anyway, modern times. So I'll say some things about Locke on personal identity. And then I'll ask sort of what cognitive science has to offer us in terms of a self. Locke famously advocates for a psychological criterion for personal identity, continuity of, the, of consciousness and memories, something roughly like that. Um, well, what does, you know, what do I think anyway, contemporary cognitive science has to offer us in the way of a psychological self. And then I'll talk a little bit about the ways in which that self changes. Um, so I'll talk about some uh, ideas concerning dynamic neural circuitry. We'll be cycling through the U's, you, uh, the ideas that which U is present at a given time by the prevailing cognitive scientific characterization of a psychological self is changing, frequently changing. And one question then arises as to what controls these changes. Um, and in connection with that, I'll talk about what I'm calling the meta-extended mind. So here, the, the idea is that each you, whenever psychological you is present at any given time, entirely internal to the body, uh, modulo, maybe something about a TVSS or an iPhone, I'm not going to worry about that. But it's possible anyway that these are entirely internal to the body. But the environment determines which you you are at a given time. And that's the sort of the role of the environment as a as a component of your meta-extended mind. I'll say more about that, of course. Um, and then, really, this is a kind of argument for the bodily basis of selfhood, ultimately. Um, it's the kind of argument up to this point is that if we focus on a psychological criterion of personal identity over time, and we take contemporary cognitive science seriously, what it has to offer us in terms of a psychological self, a mess results, a complete mess results. So if you want any kind of manageable notion of a you, a you not in scare quotes, <laughs> right? the you that can be different yous at different times, um, we need a bodily criterion. Um, it it's really comes down to the same organism. And this is, um, this is, I think, the kind of, earlier Julian was talking about personal level explanation. And I think if you're just talking about sameness of organism, I'm OK with that. Uh, that, that organisms behave in certain ways. Is a, is a kind of personal level, animal level of explanation. Um, there, are, there are other things about associated with what's normally considered personal level explanation I, I'm going to set aside. I don't want to endorse. But um, the importance of the body, of tracking organisms through time as the basis of selfhood is, uh, is what I'll ultimately sort of emphasize. And then I'll, I'll consider uh, a couple of objections and replies if I have time. OK, so John Locke, I don't know what this is, about 1695 or so. Uh, he's writing about the body. Um, there are multiple editions of the essay. So, um, and they run through that time period. But Locke says the following kinds of things. In case after case, he says, the intuitive answer about personal identity or the self is obvious. So first remark, he's treating personal identity, your person, and yourself as interchangeable. He says this explicitly. Right? I'm going to do the same. Um, secondly, the question about personal identity may not be you know, familiar to everyone. But the, the fundamental question is just, um, 
what determines that two persons or selves existing at two different times are the same person, right? I'm the person who, you know, went off to college uh, when I was young and, you know, is the same person who liked to play, you know, tabletop war games when I was eight and, you know, is the same person who was born to my mother on a certain day, right? I'm the same person all along. What determines that there's one person, I'm identical to that one, not to one of my brothers or to um, someone completely unbeknownst to me as I stand here now. Locke says, gives this as one of many cases where he appeals to our intuitive reactions. He says, think of it this way, far-fetched example, philosopher's thought experiment, cut off my finger. If my consciousness were to go with it, then myself goes with it. And I won't care about what happens to the rest of the body to which the finger had been previously attached. You know, I might have a certain fondness for it, a certain affection for it, but you know, it's gone. You know, I'm in the finger now. If that's where my consciousness goes, that's where all the memories reside, um, then that's where the self goes. It's obvious. And I won't want to be held responsible for what that body does as it goes forward. That's another sort of diagnostic reaction. It's like. Um, if my, little, if my finger were cut off and my consciousness went with it, my first person perspective went with the finger, with, yes, with the finger, and the remaining body went out and robbed a bank, I wouldn't want the finger imprisoned for it. I wouldn't want me put in prison as the intuition that's supposed to be driving this. So Locke says, our thinking about such cases is clearly driven by a consideration of psychological continuity, not um, uh, bodily continuity. 90-some percent of the body uh, is cast aside when the finger's cut off. Locke makes similar arguments about the immaterial soul or immaterial substance. Here's one, one version of it. He says, you know, some people believe that all the, all the souls were created on the seventh day in the Judeo-Christian mythology. Right? That, you know, God created the world in seven days, and the seventh day, I guess, all the souls were made. I think Locke says the seventh day, but didn't God rest on the seventh day? Now that I read that, I think my Judeo-Christian knowledge is, is, is pretty weak, clearly. So he must have said the sixth day. Um, uh, the, uh, the claim he makes, though, which seems I think it's pretty obvious, is that there's a big gap between then and when your memories began, right? When are your earliest memories? Uh, when you were three or four or five. Well, that's a long time after uh, the creation was supposed to have happened. Um, so clearly, your immaterial substance can exist without your conscious experience and memories. It did for millennia, maybe. Right? In which case, it's possible that a soul have different sets of memories and experiences at different times. Not a, not a uh, deductively valid inference, but plausible enough inference. If, if that soul was around without conscious memories that I have associated with myself, then why couldn't it have some other ones in the meantime? Right? Um, what's to stop that? Right? Well, it's clear that different consciousness, consciousnesses, that's plural, with different sets of memories and experiences would be different persons, Locke says. So sameness of immaterial soul is not the basis of personal identity. Rather, psychological continuity grounds personal identity. And that's what's driving the very judgment about the identity of the immaterial soul at different times. It's just. Locke's just saying, in this case after case, he discusses that, look, our judgments follow psychological continuity. When you describe things in terms of a continuous consciousness at any given time has memory of a similar set of events, right? um, when you describe con uh, possibilities that way, our judgment about where the self goes is always the judgment that the self goes with the consciousness um, and the continuous set of memories relatively continuous set. I think we might, in some sense, reverse Locke's reasoning, though. Um, Locke's arguments appeal to what he calls strange suppositions. He asks his reader to forgive him for this. Um, but, but I want to say to Locke, look, maybe reality is a lot weirder than your imagination. Maybe reality is weirder in ways um, that cognitive science is only revealing to us right now. What if the psychological self changes in deep and important ways, sort of cycling through a number of incarnations on a regular basis in normal subjects? Right? Might that be a reducto of the psychological criterion? I don't know, uh, if, if, 
Uh, the description I just gave about the current deliverances of cognitive science is correct. If your person is changing, you know, day in, day out in various ways, right? Um, then if your psychological person is changing, um, that might then just be a reason to reject psychological continuity as the basis of personal identity. You might just say then, well, to heck with all the psychological continuity then. There is so little of it. <laughs> Let's just go ahead and um, track people the way we normally track people in the real world, by their bodily continuity, and the fact that it's the same organism moving through time and space. All right, so this will be, seem familiar to those of you who were here five or six hours ago. The idea is that um, I want to identify the, the psychological self uh, as best I can given contemporary cognitive science. I gave a little bit of background about this earlier this morning, but you know, I can give you a, a freestanding spiel about it, um, which is that according to this theory of the cognitive, a state is cognitive if and only if it's a state of a mechanism that's part of a cognitive architecture. And that's the statement of it. I don't think this is question begging. I often do get questions like some I got earlier today that seem to be in this vicinity. Um, because being a cognitive architecture is characterized in the standard scientific way as a construct playing the appropriate causal explanatory role vis-a-vis -vis the paradigmatic explananda in the science in which cognitive serves as a theoretical term. And it's like electricity. It's, it's introduced as a way of trying to explain a certain range of phenomena. Right? So whatever emerges, maybe it's a field, a certain kind of field emerges in, in electrical theory as a way to explain electrical phenomena. Calling that an electrical field isn't sort of question begging or something. It's just to say that's the kind of construct that was introduced and successfully exploited to account for the explananda that motivated the development of electrical theory. Right? So I don't want to get, get hung up on cognitive in cognitive architecture. Right? But I, I think this is the best example of a self that will get, I would claim anyway. Why? Well, there's this consistent division in successful cognitive scientific models of all stripes between what might be called the architecture and the other causal contributors to the production of intelligent behavior. There's the data, I'm setting that aside. Right? And then we've got, um, whether you're doing connectionist modeling, computationalist modeling, many forms of dynamicist modeling, subsumption-based architectures, evolutionary robotics, standard kind of cognitive neuroscientific modeling, right? You go through all these cases and your models seem to have this kind of uh, distinction in them. It's a different distinction in different cases because you're working within different modeling traditions and within different frameworks. But there's always this distinction between the kind of integrated package of kind of basic units, operations, elements, the way they interact uh, as a group that persists over time can be um, applied to lots of different experimental contexts. That's normally a good thing if your model is robust. You can use it to explain data in different experiments, right? Um, and then there's the kind of stimulus, the passing creative stimuli that gets included in the model. And then there's also the data, the reactions. Right? And, you know, that, to me, that says, what's, what's the kind of thing that persists over time um, that we might identify as a self? It would be the architecture. That seems to be the only candidate that you get from contemporary cognitive science. Whatever that relatively integrated, relatively persisting system is, connectionist might tell you it's one thing, classical computationalist modeler might tell you something else, but they'll all say, you know, there's this relatively persisting, relatively integrated system. Right? And I'm saying, that looks like the self. Right? Because the best pattern of explanation of this Sorry, the best explanation of this pattern of results is the existence of some integrated persisting system which different models get at from different perspectives. Um, you know, we had an interesting conference here a couple of weeks ago on, on perspectival modeling in science, just generally speaking in the sciences. And, and there was a lot of inks spilled. Um, there was a lot of talk, uh, a lot of breath expended <laughs> trying to figure out you know, what it would mean to model the same system from different perspectives. 
Um, I'm not saying that was a perfectly satisfactory answer, but it's a pressing question. This, is, this seems like what's going on. Many people love the idea of pluralism, let a thousand flowers bloom, let's just all do our own thing, right? At the same time, and in many of these cases, we're kind of, it seems like we're looking at the same system. You know, we're looking at the same elements, the same objects behaving in similar kind of contexts. And we're trying to account for their, um, you know, the, the, the behavior they produce or the data we collect. Um, and in some circumstances, one kind of model seems to work better. In other circumstances, a different kind of model seems to work better. Um, one way, a tidy way, for this to work out, a tidy kind of situation where we seem justified in saying these are different perspectives on the same model, on the same system, sorry, is when the models contain some kind of commonality, even if it's not exactly the same structure uh, with the same components. Anyway, on, the, on my view, this system is an integrated set of mechanisms contributing and overlapping subsets to the production of a substantial range of forms of intelligent behavior. Um, you know, you don't use all of your cognitive mechanisms on, uh, to perform any particular cognitive task, but um, you, you look at the wide variety of tasks and you see how sort of overlapping subsets of these mechanisms um, govern the behavior that's produced across these different tasks. And so I think, yay, that's the cognitive scientific self. Um, that's the best one that CogSci has to offer. Notice the functionalist form of this. Um, Functionalist in here is used in a kind of dry sense. It doesn't mean that this has a purpose uh, or any kind of teleology, as philosophers would put it. It isn't like a goal presupposed. This is function in the, in the dry mathematical sense. Plus is a function. It takes two numbers and maps them onto their sum, right? So it's a function in that sense. And what, what's interesting about functions in this sense is that they're not tied in any way to specific materials that might make up the system that's being functionally described. Right? For a cognitive system, and thus a self as I've described it to exist, there must exist a collection of mechanisms that meet certain causal role criteria, uh, a certain criterion. Um, they contribute in overlapping subsets to the production of a wide range of forms of intelligent behavior. There's a touchstone in terms of the explananda, right? the various forms of intelligent behavior. But all that's required for a cognitive system to be there is for there to be, you know, a significant number of elements, <laughs> x1 through xn, where n is significant in some way, right? At least 30, or I don't know what it would be, right? Um, and those elements have to interact, and that can be characterized in a purely schematic way, right? Without any mention of their chemical composition, right? that sort. They have to interact so as to produce the data that we treat as uh, forms of intelligent behavior. So the point is, this functionalist construction isn't putting any constraint on the particular materials uh, the uh, cognitive system is made out of. In fact, it's such an abstract functionalist construction, it doesn't really even say which mechanisms you have to have. Right? Um, it's, not, it's not that any system any cognitive system whatsoever has to have a word form area or something, right? Um, different, different systems might have different modules or different mechanisms or different components, right? But it is mechanism-based individuation all the same, right? The overarching criterion is functionalist, but a given system is composed of specific mechanisms. Once you say, here's a cognitive system, it's a cognitive system because it satisfies this uh, schematic description, right? then once you say that, then you've got a cognitive system. Different cognitive systems will satisfy that schematic description in virtue maybe of having different mechanisms. Right? But the mechanisms make up any given system. Right? And it would seem like you change the system when you change the mechanisms. Right? And my concern, it's not really a concern, I just think it's the sort of thing that's emerging from a lot of work. Um, in cognitive science in the last decade or so, is that different collections of mechanisms sort of consistently appear at different times within the same organism. Right? And what are, what are we to say in this case? After we've individuated cognitive systems in terms of collections of mechanisms, and then somebody says, hey, you know what? The collection of mechanisms available to you at any given time is actually changing in a way that's sensitive to context, uh, environmental cues. 
And that, I think, you know, it's, it's far from clear that this is the right picture. And I might be emphasizing more variation in the mechanisms than we're really going to find, but the trend seems to be um, toward the dynamic brain. The trend seems to be toward a picture of a human organism that houses shifting sets of cognitive mechanisms. I don't just mean shifting sets in terms of which ones are contributing to the performance of a given action. That was sort of already on the table. I took that, you know, most people have taken that for granted for, for half, a, half a century, right? But the point is that which mechanisms are available to you at a given time changes, right? It's as if you were doing your homework and you know, every 20 minutes, somebody came in and pulled out one computer and substituted a different machine with different software or something like that, right? And suddenly you had a different set of tools to work with. Um, that's pretty extreme, but you get the idea. The reason I, I say you know, things are heading this way is because there's been a lot of uh, work done in the last 10 or 15 years on dynamic neural circuitry and the way in which the circuitry itself can change. Um, the circuitry of the brain changes dynamically in response to changing internal conditions. Right? Um, for example, uh, activity in uh, posterior parietal cortex can modulate the connections between V1 and V5, um, the initial area primary visual cortex and V5 is often associated with MT, the motion detecting area. Right? And um, these might show up in what we might think of as attentional shifts in behavior, right? um, tendencies to pay attention in certain ways or not. Right? Um, but it's, it's as if like, we had thought there was this area V1 and then there's this area V5 and there are connections that run from V1 to V5, and that's the circuitry of the brain, right? And those connections carry messages. Right? Um, but the pattern of those connections can actually be changed depending on what message the posterior parietal cortex is getting. Right? And so um, which circuit is actually present, and therefore which mechanism is actually there running from V1 to V5, and maybe back again because there are lots of feedback loops, right? which circuit is actually there then changes in the course of problem solving or from the solving of one problem to the next um, in response think, to task demands, in response to external cues in the environment. Uh, to make a connection here to, um, to some of what's been discussed today and to, to Andy's book, um, most recent book, uh, this is a way many people have thought um, that uh, precision weighting might change, right? Is because how do you know what sort of weight to assign? How do you know? Of course, that's metaphorical talking. But how does your uh, cognitive system change in, in such a way that, say, how seriously it takes sensory error, prediction error? Um, how, how that, how, yeah. how does your cognitive system change so that it changes how seriously it takes the prediction error? Um, sometimes when my prediction doesn't match my sensory input, eh, it's within delta, I don't care much. I just go on about my business, I don't change my model. Right? But um, you make that delta smaller than the difference between my prediction and the actual uh, sensory input may become, it becomes an issue just in this functional sense that now my model that generated the prediction is gonna be changed as a result in response to the prediction error. So you've got these kinds of a need in certain approaches to cognition, say in the, um, the um, it's getting late, <laughs> predictive processing model. All I can do is CPP in front of my head. Um, so <laughs> the predictive processing model, is that parody principle? No, <laughs> that's a different book. <laughs> so you know, you've got this central construct in the predictive processing model of precision weighting, of changing how a, a prediction error is treated in a given context. So there's a big question, how is that done? And one, one possibility is that it's done in a way that's cued by the environment. Right? And what happens when it's cued by the environment? Well, the circuitry changes, essentially. Right? Now, you know, this doesn't have to be part of the parallel uh, uh, predictive processing um, framework, but that's one kind of context in which it's coming up. Um, the fact, the example of PPC modulating the relation between V1 and V5 is from a paper by Friston and colleagues that I think you cite in your, in your book, Andy. So there are different ways this can happen. One way this can happen is by volume transmission. Um, so we're familiar with the idea that, uh, are most of us anyway, I suppose we're familiar with the idea that um, axons terminate at dense 
and there's a synaptic juncture, and the, you know, at the tip of the axon, um, vesicles can open up and neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic juncture and they get taken up at the dendrite and gates open and all the stuff we learn about the communication between neurons occurs, right? Um, but that's this kind of local point-to-point -point, um, communication, right? Uh, it's wiring transmission, as it's sometimes called, right? But there is a whole science, it's probably 20 some years old now, um, and maybe even older, but I, I saw it being written about first in the 90s, right, of the effect of neural modulators, right? So you think about, you know, what your brainstem does to put you to sleep. Um, it doesn't just send out a signal along uh, one wire or a small set of wires to, like, make you, like, turn off your consciousness or something, right? It releases uh, chemicals diffusely that then sort of slow things down and put you to sleep, very roughly speaking, right? So diffusion is one of the mechanisms um, that's an alternative to wiring transmission. But there are also these cases where um, little vesicles, like detachable vesicles, can sort of be released and go out and wander around um, and then pop and release their, their message far away from the release site. Right? And so uh, this is fascinating stuff. In a way, then, this can affect the processing in a given region of cortex. So it might make the region of cortex that uh, the neuromodulator has been sent to more sensitive. Um, might lead to associate with long-term potentiation or some phenomenon like that, right? where synapse has, has become much more sensitive, um, more higher probability that it will fire given a, a certain level of neurotransmitter. So, like I say, it's cool stuff. Um, how it changes circuitry is now up here on the screen, at least one possibility. This is taken from a paper by, uh, originally from a paper by Ignati from 2010, Ignati and colleagues. Um, I took it from Mike Anderson's book, um, After Phrenology, that has a lot of work on the sort of neural reuse and dynamic circuitry. Um, and he says, you know, you've got, a, you've got a little neural circuit here, very small, well, we have eight neurons. Right? Well. Let's look at the key here. Um, uprating, upregulating volume transmission signal. And it's, that does the sort of thing I was describing a minute ago, makes the synapse more sensitive, basically. Right? And you've got, in the blue arrow, downregulating uh, volume transmission signal. Right? That's a case where this chemical that's been released diffusely has a different effect here than it has here, because these cell walls have different properties. And this one here is, um, leads to, when the chemical arrives here, it leads to a desensitization of that synapse. It's harder to, for that synapse to fire. Right? And so when, you know, when um, VT, uh, VT chemical 1 is released, right, you might get this effect where this, is, this channel is hypersensitive and more sensitive than what's been deadened over here. And so activation of the initial neuron leads to output A. If you get uh, a different chemical being released diffusely into this region, then you get uh, different patterns of increased sensitivity and decreased sensitivity. So now what happens when you stimulate this neuron is that you get output B, similar shift for output C. Well, the idea that, you know, that I'm promoting here is that those kinds of shifts in neural circuitry are the sorts of shifts that can change mechanisms. Maybe not in every case, but it changes what mechanisms are available to you because it changes sort of what's being computed, right? uh, what functions are being computed. And ultimately, that's, you might think that's really what mechanisms are. particularly if you sort of interpret function and compute, compute very broadly. Um, all right, so is there a changing self then? Well, in at least some cases, the alteration of the neural circuitry plausibly changes the set of mechanisms available for the production of intelligent behavior. If the mechanisms change enough and with enough regularity, it's plausible that the individual organism houses different architectures at different times, and thus different psychological selves at different times. And the force of my argument here today really depends on how often that happens. And that is an open empirical question. 
but this is one of those cases where I'm trying to act as a kind of philosopher of cognitive science, trying to get my finger on the pulse of things and say, hey, it looks like that's going to happen a lot. Right? That's the trend. Right? But even though there's a change, just go back to the previous slide, put the changing self question mark, even though there's plausibly a change in the architectures and thus a change in the psychological self, on the other hand, it really doesn't seem like there's a change in the self. Right? The changes in circuitry and in the psychological self do not seem to change the self as we normally treat it. Right? So the fact that my ability to compute various functions changes uh, over time, that there's a significant difference in the functions I can compute at different times of my day or different times of my week, uh, doesn't just going back to kind of Locke's intuitive reactions, it doesn't seem to show that I'm a different person as we would normally use that term. Right? Um, you know, if we're, if we're natural born architecture shifters, if that's kind of what we are, right, then, uh, then that's certainly, we certainly don't want to say that's a change of self because that's part of sort of how human biological organisms have evolved so that they can switch out the circuitry that's available to them in response to environmental cues. Right? Um, so, so I think for forensic or biographical purposes, and I would claim for anchoring the very study of what we take to be cognition, the self survives these circuitry changes. Right? It survives changes in what I'm claiming is the psychological self. Now you might just reject the argument for that reason. You might go back to my early slides and say, Rob, those sets of mechanisms, that really isn't the psychological self anyway consider some objections like that, I think. Um, but, you know, if you think that my claim about architectures or architectures as collections of integrated mechanisms, if you think that's at all on the right track with regard to the psychological self, the self that's emerging from cognitive scientific investigation, then it looks like you've got changes in the psychological self in circumstances where we don't want to say the self changes. So what's our alternative? I would say our alternative is this, the self of importance, the responsible self, the developing self, the intelligent self, the learning self is grounded in the organism. It's, Locke was wrong. It turns out to be same as the organism over time. Um, that is same self after all. And maybe we have to, you know, modulate that in some ways or qualify that in some ways. Turns out we, we understand our evolutionary history better. We can you know, maybe say, hey, these are the kinds of changes in architecture that our organism is kind of meant to tolerate. Right? And these are situations that it's not meant to tolerate. So maybe in cases of severe um, psychological dysfunction, right? we also find that there's significant biological dysfunction. Um, and in those cases, we might say sameness of body doesn't suffice for personal identity. You really have become a different person when there's enough change in the architecture, the kind of changes maybe that someone sees when schizophrenia appears in late puberty or early adulthood. But I'm talking about, and the focus of today's talk is, is neuronormal, you know, neurotypical subjects, not clinical subjects, all right. And one thing I think that's interesting is that these changes occur without instructions. That's the, look, I think there'd be an easy response to a lot of this. Uh, easy objection, really, to what I'm saying, if there were instructions, right? The pushing aside of the psychological self would be unmotivated if the shifts in circuitry were psychologically controlled, say, by explicit instructions encoding the conditions under which circuits should shift, right? If, if the, uh, the brain were running on, you know, explicit instructions, it's like stored program computing, Right, so you've got this set of instructions about how the computing should go that's now been loaded into RAM, right? And the instructions say, if you have to perform task A, then rewire <laughs> this part of the, the system. Use these commands to affect the rewiring. Right? Um, then there would be grounds, I think, to resist. Say, these explicit instructions um, would show you what's constant, psychologically speaking. And that would give you a kind of psychological anchor to, um, you know, to kind of attach your judgment of continuing identity to in the psychological realm. 
So you'd say, hey, this is a complicated psychology. We have these plans for when to change ourselves up and when not to, but there really are plans, and the plans are part of our psychology. Problems are not there. That's the, that's the worry, right? No evidence of this happening. Moreover, there's no instructions or evidence are coming from the environment either. Its role seems to be more like brute triggering. Now, I put that in scare quotes because I think we might want to talk a little bit more about what, how to conceive of these contextual cues that the environment gives us that in, in a metaphorical sense are saying, use computing structure A now. <laughs> that would be the appropriate circuitry to wire up. There's, a, there's at least some sense in which they're doing this in kind of a brute causal way rather than involving representations, uh, explicitly encoded instructions. All right then, so it's kind of an objection and a response. Um, what this might make us ask about is the role of the environment, and that's, I just indicated, I think we should ask more about that, and that's what I want to do now. Um, one proposal that might come out of this um, is that the one I mentioned in the outset when I went over the outline, is not that your self is extended, but there's a kind of meta-extended self, that the, the framework that determines who you are, in a psychological sense, at any given moment, isn't housed entirely in the organism. Right? Even if the organism is kind of the basis of physical identity, uh, personal identity over time, so, all right. right? Um, there's, a, there's a sense in which the organism has to cooperate with the environment to control which psychological self is present. And that's, um, that's kind of cool, I think, and it may, uh, may be relevant to our understanding of cognition. The gating mechanisms are, in many cases, best understood as being under the control of environmental conditions. So I talked about environmental cues. Your psychological self or mind is not necessarily extended, but which mind you have at a given time is controlled by the environment. If a meta-mind is a larger system that controls which mind you have at any given time by gating the gatings, so to speak, then you have an extended meta-mind. So, uh, Andy and Dave closed their classic paper uh, from almost 20 years ago now by saying, you know, we will find out, um, I can't remember the exact quote, but something like, <laughs> yeah, your eyes get big, like I'm not gonna be able to remember, right? <laughs> so we'll find out, uh, We'll see how we are truly creatures of the world, right? And you know, maybe this is a sense, maybe not the sense, but a sense in which we are truly creatures of the world. Which computing system I am at a given time depends on which one the world is sort of triggering in me. All right, so kind of a, an interim summary before we move to uh, objections and replies. Um, so the mind is individuated by a collection of available cognitive mechanisms. Um, thus, psychological continuity is determined by the persistence of such a set. Assuming a kind of biocomputationalism, this is a set of circuitry individuated mechanisms. Circuitry changes in response to the environment, which changes the collection of available cognitive mechanisms. So even if the mind isn't extended, the environment determines which mind you have at a given time. So that's kind of way of putting the last few slides in a, in a nutshell doesn't get to some of the earlier bits of the talk, but gets most of it. All right, but, come on computer. Somehow you think like pointing it at the device is gonna work better. Um, I'll just manually advance. All right, so I'm gonna claim it's a bodily basis of the self. Um, why? So I'm gonna get into a bit of the embodied versus extended kind of debate now. Um, I claim that what we like in a theory of the self is the articulation of a principle that ties together what we normally take to be the self over time. We have these time slices, you might say, or these different things that exist at different times, and we want to say, you know, two of these are identical, some other pair is not. Right? And we want a principle that binds these together. We don't, we don't, you know, of course we wouldn't want a theory of personal identity that just said, line up all the time slices of people, I'm going to sort of randomly assign um, different collections, different people to different sets. Because, um, you know, m me at five months might turn out to be grouped with, you know, my big brother at 10 months together with, you know, President Carter, Jimmy Carter, when he was 45. Right? So 
We want some kind of principle. But there are no explicit instructions in the environment or in the psyche, there should be an e at the end there, that provide a unifying principle. The only apparent alternative is the bodily material having, among many others, dispositions responsible for reacting to the environment with shifts in circuitry. What is the consistent bit that sort of ties together this series of different U's from the computational standpoint? What it is is, is the body and, and the dispositions of the material. Neural material, but other bodily material as well. Um, you know, the environment comes and goes. Um, there's a huge amount of fluctuation there. Lots of different contributions from different things in the environment on different occasions. And what you've got is a management of that, um, the reaction of that grounded in the bodily dispositions, the material dispositions of the organism. So there's a kind of you know, rationale for this. It's not just Locke was wrong about psychological continuity. There are no immaterial souls. Oops, only the body's left. No, I'm trying to say it's not just an argument by elimination of possibilities. There's actually a reason sort of to think of this in bodily terms. Right? Um, and I, I really am inclined toward a um, bodied view here rather than a, a neurocentric one. Um, there's no reason to limit these to the brain, however, and I don't just mean no reason to limit them, like, oh, in principle, it could be in the body. Um, I, I, want, I have something stronger in mind. There's sort of positive reason to want to put some of these, some of this bodily basis for personal identity over time in the non-neural body. So when we shift our focus from the mechanisms themselves to the bodily basis of them, we shift toward a more bodied and less neurocentric view. It's one thing to say, focus on the collection of mechanisms that contribute flexibly to the production of intelligent behavior. It's another to ask about the persisting physical basis of the capacity to shift among the use of sets of such mechanisms. So it might be that the production of intelligent behavior works by the cooperation of a load of mechanisms that are perhaps entirely in the brain, right? But, um, but the sort of preparation for that to happen the selection of one computing system over another, the triggering of the presence of one pattern of neural circuitry over another, may involve the, the bodily sensitivity to cues in the environment. Right? Um, and here I think we get a fair amount of undermined, undermined, yes, that kind of sensitivity. Right? All right, but why not objection? Uh, sorry, why not extended? That's an objection. Right? Why stop at the boundary of the body? Um, I've mentioned a couple of worries already. I'll, I'll go through um, those and, and others fairly quickly. There are various standing objections from the asymmetry of creation or impetus. You know, I might, I might have arranged my environment to stimulate my body, get the terminology right here, to take on one computing form rather than another in certain circumstances. I've arranged my study to get me to think a certain way in certain contexts and think a different way in different contexts. Right? Um, and then my house burns down. Right? Um, I make a new study if I have the resources. Right? If all the people die tomorrow, the study isn't going to make a new organism to inhabit it. Right? So there are some deep asymmetries like that in the relationship between the organism and its environment that I think are important. Um, there are also Things like, well, it might be a special problem in this case. It seems to me that the extended stuff involved isn't part of the functionally characterized problem solving system. Right? And, you know, the bodily stuff isn't either. Right? But if you combine this observation with some of the other objections, it sort of reinforces this view, the half of the view that says the extended stuff isn't doing it. Right? Because the, it seems like, I guess what I want to draw our attention to is the difference between. Um, the kinds of cases that have motivated many extended mind theorists and the way the world is contributing here. Right? The way the world is contributing here is um, from the standpoint of a, a functionalist or computationalist account of cognitive problem solving right? is not, um, it, it's not an element in that functionalist description. Right? It's being a cue is not the same as uh, performing a certain uh, computational routine. Right? 
So this problem is clearest from the standpoint of extended, of extended functionalism or extended computationalism. We also have, and this was a concern I was sort of giving voice to a few minutes back, a kind of concern about bloat. If the cognitive system is to be a reasonably well-defined system, the thing development of which we track over time, for example, when we're studying learning and whatnot, and if almost any old thing in the environment can have a circuitry changing effect by changing affect or attention, then we face an extreme case of cognitive bloat. Right? And this is a bit connected to the point from the previous slide, the last point. Like when somebody says to me, here is, you know, here's a button, and if you press that button, you can get the Zoid on the screen to move back and forth. Has everybody here played Tetris? Any, anyone who's never seen Tetris? Okay, Zoids are those shapes you can move around on the screen. All right, so here's a button. Use that button, you can move the Zoid around. I've got sort of a, I have a clear kind of intuition in response to that, that the, the use of the button to change what's going on the screen is part of some extended computational system. Whether it's an extended mind, we have another debate. But it's part of kind of extended problem solving system. Um, the problem the system is trying to solve is to get more points than anybody else, Tetris or you know, whoever your opponent is or your past self. But, but if what we're talking about is not the kind of focused use of a tool to augment a computation, if what we're talking about instead is just any old thing in the environment that can heighten your affect, like make you scared or make you um, happy, right? or can draw your attention uh, to a certain thing, motion, for example, right? then you might think, well, man, that's going to lead to that's going to lead to more bloat than anyone ever imagined in the <laughs> in the extended mind debate, right? Um, you get this enormous number of things, variety of things, being part of the physical basis of my identity over time. And here's a, a point that I mentioned a moment ago, too, is that the, the circuitry shifting undermined may be sensitive to a wide range of triggering factors. You know, up here I just say, like, oh, any old thing could change your affect or your attention, um, any old thing in the environment, and to, to sort of reinforce that point or emphasize it. I want to sort of get you to reflect on um, the extent to which cognitive science has shown over the past 50 years or so that much of our behavior, our thought patterns, our motivation is triggered by things in the environment that we're not consciously aware of, by things that are not taken up intentionally, by things that um, we don't even know are affecting um, our motivation or strategy and problem solving. And so, you know, once you kind of bring that stuff to mind and focus on that, you think, I think this problem of bloat becomes even more of a threat. All right, one last uh, objection I think um, we can fit in. Why not, why not try to anchor the psychological self to a representation of the self? Right? So earlier, you know, I argued that cognitive science offers a functionalist kind of view of the self. It's this collection of integrated mechanisms that shifts so much. That means your psychological self is shifting all the time. Um, at that point, I think objectors might step in and say, well, wait, you know, your psychological self might not be shifting if we can find something that's constant across these other changes. One possibility that I already considered was a set of explicit instructions that would govern the changes. That might be a thing that's constant that we could sort of hang our uh, sameness of, of person over time on. Right? But we also might do it in terms of representation of the self. Right? There are mechanisms parts of the cognitive system that have a kind of proprietary connection to the psychological self. There are representations of the self, for example. I mean, that's the most um, clearly proprietary mechanism would be a mechanism that's used to track the self, tell a story about the self, refer to the self. So we might, it might be required that the system possess a self-representation. Right? Maybe that's enough. And might it be sufficient for sameness of psychological self that such a consistent representation be present? Right? Why not? Right. Well, I'll consider a couple of cases. I don't think this works out. And here's how it's supposed to go in a positive sense. What I've been portraying as changes in circuitry that change the functionally defined cognitive system might not change one's self-concept. That might remain constant. 
And such constancy there might preserve psychological unity and thus protect the psychological criterion from my criticisms. Locke wins. I don't think so. I think the content of the self-representation is too shifty. It shifts around too much. Why? What determines the content of the self-representation? It's not just schematic. If it were schematic, then you and I would share the same self-representation, and that, that could get pretty weird. Um, but the idea is that um, it's got to be like the content that I'm referring to this self. Right? So either the same self-concept is determined atomically, causally, I'll say more about that, by a brute causal relation between an atomic representational unit and the cognitive system, or it's determined by, by description, that is, by the content of the description one gives of oneself. Right? Think of this contrast as a contrast between a demonstrative, that system there, and a narrative, which says, I was born in 1964 in Butte, Montana, yeah, so on and so forth. Right? Um, problem in the, if the first case with the demonstrative is that the content shifts with changes in circuitry simply because the, the reference shifts. I can carry around a little demonstrative that says, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's somehow like reflexively pointing at the system. But if the system is changing all the time, the circuitry is changing, then the content of that unit changes. So appealing to the consistency of its content isn't going to do the job. Right? Once you take away the reference and you just have the bare demonstrative, then that doesn't seem like a plausible basis for personal identity at all, just that you have a schematic pointer. Right? But if we go with narratives, then you know, just bracketing a lot of the um, what you might think of as the kind of subpersonal neuroscientific work, um, thinking about things more at the level of cognitive psychology, we have these problems with the reconstructive nature of memory and of narrative. I don't really think they're problems. I think in everyday life, it's kind of fun. But, um, but the point is, um, we, we do operate this way. Memory, the process that generates your memories, your reports of memories, and that's the content of your description about yourself, is not a process that finds the exogram stored at a given address or something and just pulls it up finds the code, and then reads the memory and sticks it back where it goes. Right? Um, right? Each time you remember something, a uh, variety of neural factors, cognitive factors, um, interact to produce the content of that memory. There may be some fairly consistent ones, right? but there are, lots of, there, there are lots of fluctuations. You know, a minute ago I said I was born in 1964 in Butte, Montana. I was actually born in Bozeman, Montana. Um, it was a performance error, but it was a performance error that was generated by a pretty obvious kind of psychological mechanism. Later on in life, my father lived in Butte for, for decades, right? And so I just you know, sort of switched him up, right? So this kind of stuff happens all the time. Some are performance errors, but performance errors blend into like just error, I don't want to say errors, but differences that are generated by the messiness of this, these procedures that recall past experiences. And it's similar with the narrative, right? When you give a narrative yourself, which may be a, just a kind of memory, but um, may be different in some ways as well. The, um, you know, the story shifts a little bit. Right? Maybe a lot of bit. Right? Sometimes it's due to forgetting. Sometimes it's just due to sort of selective report, right? I think about myself in one way, one day. Um, yeah, I was this, you know, Free and easy hippie kid. Yeah, that's what I was as a teenager. And then, I'm like, and then some other day I'm like, oh, no, I was really into literature and foreign languages and math. And maybe they're both true. Maybe neither one's exactly true. Maybe, you know, but what I say to people may depend a lot on the context. Right? Um, and it, it may not be calculated or manipulative or anything like that. That's, it's just the way the brain works when it's producing narratives. The worry then is that your story of yourself, one story of oneself, changes with context, plausibly as often as the circuitry changes, maybe not in lockstep with it. But it's not going to give you uh, an anchor for a psychological criterion of selfhood over time. Uh, what will is the body. Um, and so we'll leave it there. Thanks. <laughs>